This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hi, welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc and I'm here with Michael Rayner, who is a managing director at uh, Deloitte LLP and also uh, the author of numerous books in, in strategy. Uh, he was uh, the co-author with uh, Clay Christensen of The Innovator's Solution, which we can think of as, I guess, a sequel to The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, also the author of this book, uh, The Strategy Paradox, which is something I've been assigning to my students for a good uh, 10 years or so, well, probably, I guess, what now, 13 years or so? It's been out uh, for a while, uh, really powerful book. Um, also, The Innovator's Manifesto, which is super cool. And I have to confess that um, it's buried somewhere in my house and I was rummaging around in the books, in the boxes, and I couldn't couldn't. You might be it. surprised to hear I have a copy. I can I can, I can can flash one of those if you like. Well, I, I actually I actually went ahead and downloaded a Kindle. Um, if I had used Kindle for everything, then I would never have this problem, but I have to keep one foot in kind of old school something. And so I read paper newspapers and have paper books. And the problem with paper books, of course, is that um, when I travel, which I haven't done in a while, I have one suitcase full of books and then like a couple pairs of underwear that I wash in the sink. So it, it really, it does, there, there are some costs, but I do have wonderful piles of books everywhere in my house, which, which you know, I'll probably die when one of them falls over on my, on my head. Um, and also, uh, the author of uh, Three Rules, How Great Companies Think. So prolific author, I would say super influential uh, thinker in, in many ways, uh, certainly been influential uh, on on me. Uh, so welcome, Michael. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. So I mentioned that you're very influential on me and, and uh, I think you were able to help articulate some of the things that that I had been thinking and that many others had been thinking for for a long time. When I kick off my strategy course for for MBAs, I use the classic uh, cores case, which um, um, you maybe you know if you're like me, you just kind of read Harvard cases just for fun and, and giggles. And in that um, case, uh, we it's kind of a bait and switch for the students because uh, we start off by analyzing why this company was so successful. And we learn that when it comes to strategy, right, all the parts have to fit together. You have all the compliments have to be exploited. You know, you have to make a, a, a commitment to a very specific vision. Um, and then just like the poor little mouse in Robbie Burns poem that you reference in your book, uh, that's when that's when bad things happen and uh, you get caught off guard and your business model turns out to be the wrong one for, for the new environment. Um, and, uh, so this, this really, when you came out with your book and you highlighted the idea that, you know, in our strategy classes, we talk about the importance of commitment and, but we also talk about the importance of, of flexibility. Um, and you know, intuitive students raise their hand and they say, well, you know, can, can you be both? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and if, if you're, if you could magically be both, then, then everything would be fine. But ultimately you have to make, make these choices. Um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, where this insight came from and, uh, and, and how you really began to put, um, uh, kind of some structure around it? Sure. Yeah. I think I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take the cue on the setup and I'll switch my beer brands and say the challenge is fundamentally, how can you be taste great and less filling, right? All, all at the same time. Um, and it's, uh, and I think I came to the problem in pretty much the same way, uh, that you've just described it, which is that having spent a lot of my time, um, uh, having, um, gone undergrad, worked in a small consulting firm, gone back and done my MBA, came out working for a, a larger consulting firm, working, uh, as a consequence with, uh, larger, more complex companies, constantly running into, uh, without realizing it quite so explicitly, but running into precisely that sort of trade-off, the notion that um, we've got to make commitments in order to be successful, um, but uh, but we find ourselves necessarily having to commit based on assumptions about the future, and the future has a rather annoying way of turning out differently than we than we planned. Certainly the last year has um, brought that phenomenon into sharp relief for pretty much everybody. Um, and where I ended up uh, trying to grasp the nettle, as it were, is in the course of 
my doctoral research uh, um, because there that's when I sort of had this interest in studying comms and entertainment companies that have been grappling with the uh, uh, with with the the dot com revolution as it was being born through the early and mid 90s. So a lot of the phone companies and remember phone companies, there used to be phone companies, phone companies and cable companies and um, media conglomerates that were wrestling with the birth of the Internet as a new mechanism of distribution. And what did that mean for their for their businesses? And uh, in industry after industry, they were grappling with precisely that challenge. And um, I did my my doctoral work at HBS, and HBS is is very uh, clinically driven, right? So you you spend a lot of time talking to managers in the field, and as a result of just looking at the portfolios of companies that they were building and the way in which they were managing them and how they talked about what they were doing, the inferences that I drew were that they were uh, trying to have their cake and eat it too, right? To uh, invoke yet another food and drink metaphor which is how, how can they in fact position themselves to be successful across a range of futures without sitting on their hands and waiting until they knew what they needed. And so they were building these portfolios of assets and capabilities and trying to keep them close enough to be integrated when required, but far enough apart that they could go in different directions if they needed to. And so a lot of what uh, the business press I felt was observing at the time as a lack of decisiveness uh, was in fact a, uh, a, a, a deliberate attempt to preserve optionality. And a lot of what the business press was observing as, as rash overinvestment in, in, in acquisitions with unclear strategic significance was in fact a, a, an attempt to create that optionality, right? To, to make the minimum necessary commitment uh, and then manage it in a, in a dynamic way. Uh, and that turned into my doctoral thesis, which a few years later turned into the strategy paradox, which was an attempt to express those, those learnings in a way that was more ex accessible and useful uh, for practicing managers. Yeah, and I think the business press uh, was, I think in alignment with at least one part of, of Michael Porter's theory, right? So the business press would um, look at excellent companies and, and kind of mediocre companies and the excellent companies were the ones that made, you know, bold uh, commitments and, and the mediocre companies were the ones that kind of hemmed and hawed. Um, uh, and, well, and, you know, if, what, if you'll forgive me, and the stupid companies were the companies that made bold commitments that didn't turn out right. Yeah, but they're they're also kind of they they were kind of left out because the uh, the survival survivor uh, survivorship bias like they were they weren't in the data set anymore, right? I mean, the, 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 and in Paradox, I talk about companies like Vivendi, um, which is probably lost in the recesses of, of folks' memories. But Vivendi was uh, a, a darling of the press in, in the early 2000s. And then it was a, a, you know, a complete disaster. And they were dismissed as having been a victim of hubris and arrogance and all manner of personal failings. And the observation I guess I would make is with, without expressing an opinion on whether that's true or not, an equally defensible position, it seems to me, is that those were just big bets that turned out wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, you can't go to Vegas and think that the folks who won at roulette know any more about what's going on than the folks who lose at roulette. They are all playing the same game in the same way. And understanding the difference between outcomes that are driven by just bad luck versus good luck versus good management versus bad management is not nearly as straightforward as a lot of folks, it seems to me, tend to think. Yeah, I mean, I think hindsight bias is, is something that, that a lot of us specialize in and, uh, and certainly um, we, we tend to underestimate the role of luck, um, not only in our ex explanations, but also when it comes to um, attributing credit and blame uh, and uh, awarding compensation packages, right? Uh, and so te teasing that apart and figuring out whether what looks ex post to be a bad decision, you know, was ex ante a bad decision because, you know, ex post, the probabilities all go to one or zero, but we don't know what the probabilities were back when, when the decisions were made. Yeah, well put. So another thing I thought I really liked in, in your writing was, you know, you talked a little bit about the, the, the role of theory and, and uh, you said that there are kind of folks in business that think of themselves as action oriented and, and they may be kind of dismissive of, 
of theory, but at the end of the day, everyone's operating uh, according to some some theory. So what's the role of um, kind of making explicit or articulating what the, the theories are that uh, business managers have? Certainly in the, in the world of startups, we've seen this massive um, uh, kind of revolution in thinking where people will explicitly talk about the hypotheses that they're testing, right? And in some sense, every business decision is built on some kind of kind of hypothesis. Um, what is the role of theory? Why, why, what do managers need to think about? Can they just go and do their thing and rely on their gut? Uh, or do they need to, to really uh, have some kind of operating theory in, in place for them to be successful? Yeah, I mean, have to is an interesting admonition. I mean, certainly my my view of it is that you're well served to have an explicit understanding of the theories that motivate your choices, right? So to say, well, I'm going to follow my gut is to say I'm going to follow a theory that is only implicit as opposed to making these, these choices in ways that are explicit and as a result, uh, more easily and more effectively communicated to others which is often very important because after all, it's not just you, it's entire organizations and teams of people that you're trying to motivate and align so that they are in positions to make choices and decisions that reinforce the direction you're trying to go. So having a, uh, a shared understanding of the, the theory of the case, if you will, I think can be tremendously empowering for at an organizational level. Um, and being explicit about the theories that drive your decision making is something that uh, has motivated me for a long time. I mean, my undergraduate degree is in philosophy, and philosophy is a form of precisely that: attempting to mm -hmm. be explicit and clear, and to unpack our intuitions, the the theories that guide some of our most personal choices. And so, I kind of carried that um, that bias and that predilection into my into my career for essentially all of my career. And then certainly the importance of theory is something that I, um, uh, a sense of the importance of theory is something that I've long shared with uh, um, the late Clayton Christensen, whom I worked with closely and whom I count as a, as a good friend. And, uh, and that was something that, uh, that he felt as well. And so we had that, that in common and, uh, and spent some time developing some of those thoughts together, some of which is captured in the Innovator Solution, some of which is in... Um, I think um, in the work that I've done most concisely in, a, in an article that he and I did in the HBR quite a few years ago when, when Solution came out, that was about the, the role of theory in managerial decision making. So um, I, I think it's critically important. Um, last thing I'll offer on this uh, in response to your question is that when you think about startups and the theory of the case and how they kind of sell the investment thesis for their businesses, what I've tended to see there is um, uh, a lack of discrimination with respect to what is in fact the relevant theory. Um, uh, I've often said the marketplace for ideas is, is horribly inefficient when compared to things like the marketplace for financial assets. And so it, it's, it's very fashionable, very trendy. And so people show up and, uh, you know, for a time, everybody was the Uber of X, whatever that mm -hmm. industry happened to be. And then everybody was the Facebook of Y or the Google of Z or whatever it happened to be. And so it wasn't so much a clear eyed understanding of the thesis behind their business as an attempt to simply wrap themselves into, you know, whatever the trendy ideas of the day happened to be. So that they could uh, they could pitch their business in using an analogy or a metaphor to something that happened to be particularly hot, and it started to look like everybody was pitching a movie. You know, it's kind of it's Forrest yeah, like it's Forrest Gump meets Saving Private Ryan meets uh, you know Apollo thirteen. That's the that's the right. pitch, right? Well, I guess I, I should have I should have known you're a philosophy major, right? In this podcast called Unsiloed, and we're always looking for, you know, people who are philosophers on the on the inside and and uh, you know, hardened business folks on the outside. Um, and so I guess you'll you'll probably recognize the when the late Bernard Williams he said something very similar when he said that the marketplace for ideas there's there's absolutely no reason ex ante to believe that it is um, it, it is efficient and that it leads to the to the truth. Um, but let's, let's circle back to, um, your work with, with Clay. So, um, you know, his theory of disruption is one that's, that's, I think, um, more spoken of than understood. Uh, you know, when people, it seems like every time you use the word disruption, you have to 
have a footnote and say, you know, of course, Clay Christensen, but the way people use the word today is obviously much broader. There was a very specific hypothesis that he had about how it happens. And, and I, I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, first of all, maybe tell us what that was. And then also, uh, to what extent has it, has it aged well or, or poorly given the kinds of disruptions that we have seen uh, in, in more recent years? Um, and then maybe also talk about kind of the actual attempt that you made to operationalize it, which you talk about in your um, Innovator Solution. Well, no, it was the other one. The um, Manifesto. Uh, yeah, Innovator Manifesto, which which I, I thought was, uh, you know, very, very interesting because it, it basically said that you can train yourself either as a corporate manager to better identify um, successful projects. You could train yourself as an investor to kind of better identify uh, successful um, startups uh, with a little bit of this theory. Um, so that's a, that's a couple big questions. Yeah, but. a lot in there. Um, so it, it's uh, it won't surprise you. I've got sort of a um, uh, a, a potted answer to that question. Uh, something I've addressed many times in a lot of different contexts, um, and. I always start by pointing out that Clay didn't invent the term disruption. That's a well-formed English word. It's been around for a long yeah. time. Uh, and we had no monopoly on, on the word disruption. Uh, the interesting thing I found is that disruption as an English word is, is negative, right? So, you know, a disruptive force in a grade four classroom is not a good thing. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to disrupt an election is, is, is a bad thing. You don't want to disrupt that. Um, to disrupt, to disrupt something is to introduce. Wait, chaos. America, America, half the country think that's a good thing. I understand. Um, it's uh, to 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 disrupt something is to introduce chaos into an otherwise well functioning system, right? And and that's and that's where it stops. Mm -hmm. Disruptive innovation, on the other hand, is to overturn an established system with a superior solution, right? So that's the outcome of a successful disruptive innovation. Well, it's like, I mean, creative destruction, right? The it's a, yeah, it's a mechanism. Concept. Exactly. It yeah. is a mechanism of creative destruction. It's not synonymous with creative destruction. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think is unfortunate because th there are other ways to introduce innovations into a marketplace that disrupt the marketplace without being a disruptive innovation, if you'll forgive me for splitting those mm -hmm. hairs, right? So something like Tesla, something like Uber, those are organizations that have small d, you know, Merriam Webster type um, disrupted established industries and have introduced a new solution, right, uh, uh, into those industries without having followed a disruptive innovation path. And so what I've learned and, and feel I've learned and have tried to internalize and apply is that Disruptive innovation is one of a number of different ways you can introduce revolutionary breakthrough innovations into a market space and have a tremendously positive impact. It's not the only one by any means. And there is no ex ante reason to have any religious fervor for one over the other. One's not, you know, um, deontologically better than another. They're just different. And which one you pursue is going to be a function of the technology you have, the business model you're pursuing, the market conditions you find yourself in. It's just, it, it's horses for courses. And so my concern has been that the enormous success of, of Clay's framework in the marketplace for ideas has essentially um, diluted and um, uh, blurred the sharp edges of the theory that Clay developed. And as a consequence, um, it uh, it's used in all sorts of contexts where it's not appropriate and it undermines the power of the theory and the probability of success. You know, it's uh, um, it, it's become used for all sorts of things that it wasn't intended for. And that's too bad because the the distinctions that it introduces are powerful. I think they are predictive. I think it's enormously useful, but it is not a theory of everything. And that's unfortunately what has tended to happen in general discourse. So, but to what extent is that is that semantics? I mean, the the very specific claim that um, this disruptive innovation happens, uh, where you know the point of entry is 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 specifically defined. A lot of people, I think, today would say, "Well, hold on a second. You know, let's look at Tesla. Tesla is innovating by introducing something at the, at the high end, not the low end. They're not right. addressing some." 
you know, need that nobody wants to address. They're, they're, they're just plunging right in and taking on head to head, the, you know, Mercedes Benz and, and BMW. And then later they're going to go after Ford and, and GM. This is, this is, this is not Clay Christensen. This is something completely different. Clay's wrong, right? Well, so I would agree with everything except your last statement. So it is something completely different. But that doesn't mean Clay is wrong. It means that Clay's theory is not a theory of everything, right? Mm-hmm. So if you know, if you think about medicine and there are the ways in which uh, people diagnose and treat heart disease is very different from the way they diagnose and treat orthopedic disease. Does that mean the cardiologist is wrong? No, it means that you shouldn't ask a cardiologist to treat your osteoarthritis. Um, and so Clay's theory, uh, the theory of, of disruptive innovation allows you to identify certain circumstances ex ante in ways that allow you to both predict and shape outcomes more effectively than you would have otherwise. And my observation, our observation in the in the 2015 uh, HBR piece, right, what is disruptive innovation, use the Tesla example and say, look, Tesla is not following a disruptive innovation path. It's following a different path. And that's fine. Like that, <laughs> that's not a criticism. Mm-hmm. And indeed, my view is that the power of disruption theory is enhanced by having very clear and sharp distinctions uh, so that we understand where to use it and where not to use it. Mm-hmm. You know, when should you use a Robertson screwdriver, Canadians, I'm going to say Robertson screwdriver, a Phillips screwdriver and a slot screwdriver, and you want the right tool for the right job. Mm-hmm. And understanding those distinctions is enormously powerful, not a criticism of, uh, of Clay's theory in my view. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, in, in academia, uh, we often see advocates of this or that theory, uh, failing to articulate their boundary conditions and, uh, you know, they lack the humility that, um, you've just expressed, which is to say, you know, Hey, this is useful. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's not the pill that'll grow back your hair and cure your cancer, but it, it will, you know, it will provide some, uh, very good benefits and, and, you mentioned in the, in the book you discuss in the, um, uh, the experiment you did with the, the MBAs. Um, and I think the, the motivation was, was quite clear. You talked about the explanatory power of a theory, but also kind of the predictive, uh, importance of, of a theory. How did, how did, what was your, um, motivation behind this experiment? Maybe you could talk a little bit about it. And do you think that this is something that, um, we should be doing more of in, in business schools? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, clearly, I, I mean, I have a bias here. My view of it is that we benefit from testing these theories in a way that um, that put their predictive power uh, on the line. And and what I what I think what I learned from that effort, I was going to say what I discovered, but that seems to oversell it a bit. I also, what I think I learned is that there can be and there can be a, a significant trade off here between the explanatory power versus the predictive power. And what I mean by that, and I've seen this happen with disruption theory by people who've spent their careers working with and understanding disruption theory very deeply. So these aren't people who, um, you know, who, who don't understand theory from the ground up. But what can happen is that in their desire to enhance the theory's power, they are continually layering on additional dimensions of the theory in order to explain the outcomes that they've observed. So you find something that looks like it's a disruption. And then at some, you know, somewhere along the way, it takes a bit of a left turn from what you thought the theory was, you know, what the theory predicted. And so you, you, you say, well, I'm going to learn from that, right? I've got to hear an anomaly to the theory. And so what I will do is I will improve my theory to account for that anomaly. And so now all of a sudden, um, you're, you're not just extrapolating the theory into new territory, but in so doing, you turn around and look back and you look at the error term in your extrapolation, and then you make it go away by interpolating, by sort of perf- perfectly fitting the theory to all observed dimensions of the problem. And it doesn't take very long for what started out as a very clean uh, conceptual framework turns into this Ptolemaic universe of epicycles designed to account for every little twist and turn along the way in what is an invariably messy and difficult to understand reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real shame. And what I found in the experiments in, uh, um, in innovators manifesto that, and there were three of them 
right? And we did, we did, I'm going to back up half a step. We had a, we had a remarkable data set available to us, which was a portfolio of initiatives that had been funded by Intel as part of their internal venture capital arm. And it was a sizable portfolio, uh, you know, 40 plus uh, investments where we had outcome data on those investments, which is very, very rare. And we had permission to write these things up and use them. And so we had um, a class, two classes of MBAs at, at Harvard Business School where um, we gave them a, each student got a portfolio of five of these initiatives at the start of the class. And we said, we want you to just tell us which of these succeeded and failed. And also, we don't have time to unpack how we operationalize succeed and fail and all that goes with it. But I'll ask folks to sort of trust me for the moment that, that we gave that some careful thought and we think we came up with something that works. He said, so tell us which of these you think is gonna succeed and fail. And we got a, we didn't tell them how they did, but we have the data, of course, you know, what their hit rate was. They go through an entire semester long course on disruptive innovation. And then we try it again. We give them a portfolio this time of five different initiatives mm -hmm. and say, all right, now use everything you've learned in the course and make a set of predictions, what succeeds or fails in this portfolio of initiatives and we see if they got better, right? So we, you know, it's, it's like Karate Kid, you know, he meets Johnny Lawrence at the beginning of the movie and, and he gets pushed around and then he works with Mr. Miyagi and then he beats him at the tournament. So I guess he got better. So you can tell I've been watching Netflix during lockdown. So then we, um, we said, all right, so what uh, do they get better? And they do get better. Then we had another set that had a six week seminar at MIT and those folks got better, but they got even better than the HBS students mm -hmm. did. And then we had the final group, which was a set of MBA students at the University of Western Ontario, the Ivy Business School, and they got a 90 minute lecture and that's it. And they had the most dramatic improvement in predictive accuracy <laughs> of all of them. And so I had to make sense of that. And the, the, the differences were statistically significant mm -hmm. and practically material, mm -hmm. right? So we, we had enough data um, uh, to, to actually do this level of analysis. And what I landed on as an explanation, um, and I don't know this is true because I haven't been able to replicate the experiment, but here's what I think I learned is that the reason the folks in this semester long class didn't do as well, they got a little better, but not as much was because in the course of a semester long class, all of these additional layers of filigree mm -hmm. and Rococo explanatory features get piled onto the theory in order to explain nearly every aspect of, of 30 different cases that you do over a semester. That makes it enormously difficult to apply the theory cleanly because you've got so many things to, to, to take into consideration and the data you need to take these things into consideration is necessarily ambiguous and et cetera. And so it just gets really hard. Whereas when you have to boil it down to a 90 minute lecture, you're like, here are the, here are the three things you need to worry about this, this, and this, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And when you boil it down that way, all of a sudden you sacrifice explanatory power, but you gain predictive power. Yeah. And so now you just got to ask yourself the question, what's more valuable? Well, I have an opinion about that. I think, you know, figuring out what comes next is more valuable than understanding what's happened prior. Yeah, I think that's fascinating because, you know, as, as academics, you know, on the, you got the research side, you got the, the teaching side and, uh, and, you know, more can be less on the teaching side. Um, for sure. What I like about the experiment is it was out of sample data, right? This was, you didn't use the Intel database to generate your theory, right? The theory was well established before you had access to this data. So, um, so it, it is a, it is a nice, a nice test, very different from the way I think most, um, you know, academics might, might, you know, offer an exam, an exam to their students. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I would, I'd be grateful if someone could point me to, um, any, any experimental work that's similar to this, but I must say having looked and, you know, mm -hmm. for the, for over a decade, I, I've never seen it. Yeah. Well, well, we, I mean, this goes back to theory, right? So when, uh, I talked to some of my students who took strategy with me 10, 15 years ago, they, they say, well, you know, the most important thing I learned was, was not any real detailed specifics, but you know, the, the residue that's left over is, is what, what guides me, you know? And, uh, and, um, 
you know, being able to pull back and, and look at things from, from the top. And if you're in the trenches, you oftentimes, you get so caught up in the, in the minutiae and the details. Uh, and this actually takes us to, uh, I wasn't going to go this quickly to it, but you know, you talk about organizational structure and how important it is for there to be kind of a, a division of labor um, within the organization with respect to, uh, you know, time horizons. And you, you specifically mentioned that the corporate office is responsible for, for managing, um, uncertainty. Um, and you know, so part of it is about time horizons. Part of it is about, um, you know, variability in the environment. And of course I think they're, you know, they're correlated. Uh, and it reminds me, you know, for those sports fans out there in, in the world of, uh, American football, you know, you've got the, the GM and you've got the coach and, uh, you know, there's always these tensions and, and, you know, the coach always wants to, you know, I think Bill Belichick famously said, if I'm going to cook the dinner, I want, I want to buy the groceries. And, and I think, you know, you're making a, a clear case that uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe, you know, maybe the person in charge of stocking the larder might, 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 you might want to have someone else doing that rather than the, the, the you know, the chef uh, on the front lines. Yeah, it, it, that's um, that goes back to the strategy paradox work, and there I was explicitly building on the work of Elliot Jakes. Um, Elliot Jakes is an organizational theorist who developed this time horizon idea, which is that um, you know, people higher up in the hierarchy, if you will, that the, the, the division of labor implied in a well functioning hierarchy uh, is that. Um, folks are dealing with different time horizons, so decisions that speak to different periods of time. If you're at the top of the house, you're worried about, I, I'm, this all depends on organization and industry to be sure, so I'm simplifying for the purpose of conversation, but if you're up at the top of the house at the board, you're thinking 10 years. If it's the executive management, you're thinking five to 10 years, so you get this overlap with the board, of course, and you go further and further down, it's finally you've got people who are dealing with quarterly sales targets. Um, and that, in Jake's view and in his theoretical development and in his research, uh, is a uh, uh, well-functioning organizations respect those kinds of divisions uh, in, uh, in time horizons and the decisions related to each. And so I, I, I tried to kind of catch that pass and say, so what are the implications of making decisions that have a 10-year time horizon versus decisions that have a three-month time horizon? And it seemed to me that one of the defining features is not so much the difficulty or the complexity. Mm -hmm. I mean, making a three month sales target in any, I mean, I've never met a simple industry. One of the upsides of being in consulting for so long now is that, you know, everybody I talk to who works deep within an industry, even my colleagues who have much deeper industry specialization than I do say, well, the thing to know about this industry is that it's really complex. <laughs> and, and they all say that and they're all right. You know, there's no such thing as a simple business in my view. And so making a three month sales target and all of the practical realities that go with that, that's hard, that that's not a simple thing to do. So it's not the nature of the intellectual or practical challenge. To my mind, it's just the nature of the uncertainties that you're grappling with and being clear about that. So if you're thinking about 10 years from now, you've got a much different uncertainty quotient than if you're dealing with three months from now. Um, and so it was that that led me to the, the conclusion that separating out who's managing uncertainty, who's creating options versus who's delivering on the commitments that have been made, that it's, it's um, very powerful to separate those. To pick up on your, your sports analogy, but to change, the, uh, to change the sport, if I think about Moneyball, right, you've got, uh, you've got Billy Bean picking the players and then you've got the manager of the A's figuring out how to use them in the game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's not an unreasonable separation of responsibilities, it seems to me. One of them is creating options. The other is exercising options um, mm -hmm. based, on the, based on the conditions on the field at a, given, at a given point in the game. And if we circle back to this commitment versus flexibility, I think it was Jack Welch that said that, um, you know, when the world is changing faster uh, on the outside than you are on the inside, you know, that's, that's when, you're, when you're dead. Um, but I think you, you complement that by saying that when the world is, is changing slower on the outside than, than you are on the inside, then you're, you're, you're just as dead. So, you know, how do you, how do you figure out what the optimal level of, of flexibility is? Right. Um, and you mentioned a couple, I mean, I, I've, 
I'm a big fan of biology. I've taught biology and, and, you know, you, you mentioned a couple examples from the world of biology. You, you got the dinosaurs in there. You can't talk about, you know, disruption without mentioning that little disruption, which happened a while back, which gave birth to our, you know, our ancestors. Um, but you also mentioned, you know, Jared Diamond's, uh, uh, examples, uh, which were, which were very different, right? I mean, the arrival of the Europeans, that was a pretty massive, uh, abrupt shock, but then the, the folks in Greenland who, who just kind of, you know, they were just kind of doing their thing and, uh, and they might've actually benefited from, from a bit of a shock. Um, and I, I like, it's funny, I like to mention, I like to refer to what, what I do in my kind of corporate work as shock and awe. You know, you go into a lot of these companies that may be, seem very, you know, comfortable in their, in their, um, day to day and, and, and remind them that the comet is coming, right. <laughs> and that the, uh, uh, that the, that the cows are going to die and that the ships are going to rot and that they might want to think about, um, you know, planning for the next, uh, for getting the heck out of there. Um, how do you, how do you figure out, I mean, there's tools like strategic forecasting and scenario planning and, and so forth, but how do you decide what the optimal level of, of, uh, adaptability is? Right. Well, I, I mean, this is an explicit dodge, right? Which is in the spirit of um, uh, very few theories being a theory of everything. Uh, I would say that the, the the framework I tried to describe in the in the strategy paradox uh, only goes so far. And providing a mechanism for saying here is the optimal amount and here's how you know is something that um, that I don't have a patent answer to. Um, in my experience, very few organizations are at risk of having too much. So if you think about the, your, your bias in a sense, you, you want a bias that, that corrects for the error you're likeliest to make, it seems to me. And so thinking very explicitly about what assumptions are embedded in my current strategy and the investments and in, I'm making the commitments I have in place and how, um, how sound are those assumptions and what does that imply for what kinds of options I might need? Most organizations find themselves, if you will, underinsured for the future. Mm-hmm. Um, if we find ourselves in a world where organizations are systematically overinsured for the future and as a result unable to deliver on commitments effectively, well, then I guess we'll need a different corrective. Um, but uh, uh, I must confess, I don't have a, uh, I, I don't, I don't have a pat answer for deciding, you know, this much but no more is is the right answer. Um, to some extent, I guess I would look at it and say it becomes a constraining function, which is what is the level of commitment you need to make in order to be able to deliver what you need to deliver as an organization to deliver the growth, the profitability that you, that you have to, in order to remain a viable going concern organization. And then what does that leave you, uh, left over almost to invest in, in creating options that will insulate you against, uh, unpredictable outcomes. Yeah, but if I if I just accumulate a portfolio of you know call options and put options on every stock in the S and P, um, I'm betting my my returns won't look so good. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. So you can you can absolutely overdo it. There's no question. Um, I guess what I'm suggesting is that as a practical matter, when it comes to real options, right, which are much more difficult to create, um, organizations by and large, I don't think overdo that at all. Uh, when it comes to the kinds of financial diversification you're describing, because that's so easy to do, it's 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 real easy to end up covering every number on the roulette table, and uh, and then you're sure to end up in the hole. Mm-hmm. So how do we how do we distinguish? Um, you know, you talk about the the inevitable drift towards you know mediocrity and and how you know companies are kind of flailing around. They don't know anything about the, you know Coca Cola buys a movie studio and, and, you know, you see all these kind of crazy, uh, hedges that, that some companies engage in. How, how do you, how do you identify which of these, when you're about, when you're looking at a company and you're seeing it making these investments, um, to what extent can you evaluate the, the efficacy or maybe make a prediction by looking at it and saying, Hey, you know, this, this company has a, a sensible strategy for acquiring strategic options. And this other one is just kind of, um, you know, doing this blind diversification. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. That helps bring it into, um, sharper relief. Um, 
I draw a distinction between what I'll call growth options and strategic options, right? So if you're Coke buying a movie studio, uh, it's a reach to say the least that that had that those two things have anything any strategic synergies, right? They that's the kind of diversification where you want them to be highly uncorrelated for exactly mm -hmm. that reason. You know, the, the idea that people buy Coke in movie theaters is, uh, I don't know if that was part of the explanation back in the day. Um, if it were, if it had been, I, I would have been skeptical. Um, so it, that would be my acid test, which is as a, as a, um, when you analyze it and you think about the circumstances under which these things are strategically relevant to each other, mm -hmm that they help you compete in a new and different and potentially effective way. Uh, you know, how, how credible is that claim? Um, that's not something that you can evaluate using a mathematical algorithm. Uh, it becomes a judgment call and that's why we play the game, right? To, to, to find out who's right. Um, but those are the kinds of questions that I think one, one brings to bear in order to assess, is this a credible strategic option? Or is this me just covering another number uh, on the roulette wheel? Well, in, in your book, you, you reference uh, Ollie Williamson, my former colleagues, um, my, my deceased colleagues uh, work about, you know, theory of the firm. And, um, you know, he articulates why internal capital markets might be more um, powerful than external capital markets in some ways. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of people who have been arguing in the last couple of decades that, that, you know, external capital markets can do a much, much better job in, in a lot of ways, um, or at least have become more effective. And we see that, you know, how venture capital is, is doing its work and, you know, uh, but then, you know, then we see Amazon and then we see some of these other, uh, companies that seem to have these incredibly, uh, powerful internal, uh, capital markets that are able to, you know, fund these, these real options and these, these projects and, and some of them look like adjacencies and some of them look like, you know, uh, wild, um, uh, steps in different directions. Um, how do you evaluate that, that whole, whole discussion? Um, and if the external capital markets are more effective, then we, we shouldn't weep when a company goes bankrupt, right? We should just be like, yeah, well, you know, that's, if a company kills a project, how's that different from a capital market killing a company? It seems like if the company focuses on perpetuating itself, and extending its lifespan just for just for the sake of extending the lifespan, that's not necessarily good for the for the shareholders, right? Yeah, again, a whole, whole bunch packed in there, I guess, which is that the 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 relative efficiency of internal versus external capital markets at some levels is, is an empirical question, and it's not entirely clear to me how we would measure and test that. Um, I just don't know. The uh, I think your observation that. Um, these things go through cycles is spot on, right? If you think about the diversification wave of the 60s and 70s, um, and then you had all the, 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 the birth of the markets for corporate control and the leveraged buyouts and so forth that took apart a lot of these conglomerates because they were bloated and inefficient. And then you saw a great deal of diversification through the late 90s and early 2000s, which we talked about at the start of the conversation around building strategic options in the face of uncertainty. And then there was a lot of undoing of a bunch of that. Now you see similarly organizations diversifying arguably uh, successfully on the back of exploiting synergies and commonalities and, and, and platform effects and network effects in a lot of different industries that had previously been insulated from those forces. So I think what you're seeing is that, um, again, not surprisingly, as a result of technological and societal change, the right answer in scare quotes changes over time, but it changes for predictable reasons, right? So where, it, what is, what is the relatively efficient way of allocating, um, resources and that's financial capital, that's human capital, uh, that's uh, technological capabilities, all manner of things, right? The, the financial markets are not the only markets that matter. And, uh, and so we have found ourselves of late in a set of circumstances where the ability to redeploy, uh, technology assets, it's, it's almost a Penrosian, uh, application of the theory of the growth of the firm, right? You know, the old hot dog, hot dogs and hot dog bun argument, right? You know, hot dogs come in packs of, uh, packs of 12 and buns come in packs of eights. So you've always got some left over. So you're always buying more of the other one. Yep. And so if, if you're in a tech space and you build a platform that's good at one thing, it turns out you've got 
so you've got some capability left over, so you buy new assets to take advantage of that, and you're growing in a perfectly reasonable way, right? It's efficient in all sorts of ways. Um, so I, I, uh, I think that addresses the question, but correct me if I've, if I've missed the plot. Yeah, you know, a, a lot of discussion now is about, you know, modularity and how, how we think about modularity differently. And in particular, how, you know, APIs have enabled us to kind of break down companies into their, you know, into their smaller and smaller bits and components so that the the surplus buns or the surplus hot dogs you have or the deficit, you know, it's very easy just to go out and, you know, fill it out with uh, something as a service, right? You know, you just there's, there's, or if you have a little extra, you just productize it. And, and, uh, and so it's making it easier for, for firms to, to, you know, more, uh, configure their, their firms in, in more customized ways and kind of change those boundaries in a, in a more flexible way is I'm guessing that in your consulting work, this is probably taking up increasing amounts of your time. Yeah, absolutely. The whole notion of X as a product or X as a service is about flipping those business models in in all sorts of in all sorts of different, like what, whatever you've been historically a, a useful search strategy is to say what if we turned it into the other? If you're a product, can we turn you into service? If you're a service, can we turn you into a product? And and that's a way to test whether technology and business models have progressed to the point that it's possible to take a fundamentally a different approach to creating and capturing value in a given space. Um, and very often that unlocks and, and releases a, a, a whole bunch of new value in all kinds of interesting new ways. Um, but as I said, it's a, it's a, a very, it can be a very effective search strategy. Sometimes the results are, of the analysis are ambiguous. In fact, they almost are always ambiguous. And then guess what? It becomes a conversation about how do we create a strategic option on how to pursue that when and as market conditions and technologies catch up with this new approach. Um, because if you wait until it's clear, somebody else will have seized the pole position and that's no good. But if you commit to it right now wholeheartedly, chances are you'll be wrong. Because the idea that somehow this is the optimal moment is almost certainly not the case. So I want to turn to your work on on climate change, which I think has been occupying a lot of your um, your, your mental energies lately and, and maybe tie it together with some of the other things that you've talked about. One, one of the things that I really, um, uh, one of the observations that, that you made in, in your writing was that um, people view risk in, in a very limited way, uh, particularly people who have a finance background. And for me, I, I have a finance background and, um, and I, won't, I, was, I won't hold it my, against you. <laughs> <laughs> and in my, uh, in my, um, well, it's one of my backgrounds and in, in, the in my one of my finances class, I always talk about you know why like value at risk and volatility are, are not really good ways to measure uh, risk. You know, you could be picking up nickels in front of a steamroller, and and I think you 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 allude to this um, that a lot of managers uh, mistake absence of volatility for absence of of risk. Is is climate risk? What, what, should we think about climate risk as as some kind of overhang or is the or, or are we in you know the proverbial pot of water that's just you know getting hotter and hotter and and the real risk is that we're not noticing yeah now, how should we think about i that? think less and less the risk is we're not noticing i think there's it'd be, you'd be you'd have to make a concerted effort not to notice anymore and that's and that's all to the good um you know everybody's on their own journey i suppose to to coming to their personal views of how urgent the problem is um you know people have been ringing this alarm bell for 40 years i i i didn't come to my current position on this topic until probably five years ago so i don't i don't give anybody a hard time if 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 they don't view the world as being on fire quite so dramatically as i do because in the great scheme of things, I'm pretty late to this problem myself. So um, sort of that by way of preamble. Um, I have come to the personal conclusion that it is effectively impossible for us to do too much too soon on this problem. Uh, when people talk about the existential nature of the threat, I'm of a view that um, that is literally the case. It is not simply I mean, if all we were dealing with was flood and famine and disease, 
we would we'd, we'd cope with that just fine. We'd be able to deal with that kind of standing on our head. No yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, enormous human suffering. Don't make no mistake. But in terms of kind of the long run survival of the human species, like it's the water off the duck's back, we'll be fine. I don't think that's the case. Um, mass extinctions in the in the history of complex multicellular life on the planet. Um, have been caused in almost every case by carbon pollution, by pulses of carbon pollution. There's a paper by Daniel Rothman at MIT that I find really very compelling on this topic. He looks at cycle, what I think it's the title is something like cycles of carbon catastrophe uh, in the Earth system, and the uh, um, the great the, the Permian extinction is known as the Great Dying. It, it wiped out 95, 96 percent of all species on the planet. People who've studied it carefully will tell you that we came within a hair's breadth of the extinction of life itself. And there's no guarantee it starts up again, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you could wipe it out and Earth could turn into Mars. And the fact of the matter is that the, uh, the annual rate of surplus carbon that triggered the permanent extinction was about two gigatons a year. Do you know what current um, carbon emissions are? No. Closing in on 11 gigatons a year. Mm. So we are polluting the atmosphere at close to four times the rate that wiped out 96% of all species on the planet. That should terrify you. Certainly it terrifies me. Um, so I look at this and say that we are changing atmospheric carbon concentrations 200,000 times faster than it has ever been changed before in the history of the planet. So what do you think? Is that a small thing or a big thing? That strikes me as a big thing. And the downside is the extirpation of complex multicellular life on earth, not just disruptions in your supply chain. And that happens by the way, on a time frame that is now measured in decades and centuries, not tens of millennia. Uh, Rothman's paper says that we will reach a carbon tipping point uh, on a level with mass uh, extinction by 2100. That's that's a human lifetime from now. Um, so you can't take this too seriously. Uh, and, and in fact, my level of concern over this is for a time, speaking entirely personally, um, was really quite paralyzing. Um, it, it was it became emotionally and psychologically difficult to function taking that on board. In fact, talking about it with my family at home, um, you know, my, my, at the time, 13 year old finally looked at me and said, you know, uh, dad, you got to stop talking about this because you're really bombing me out. And I'm like, you know, Max, you got a point. So I've, I've kind of shut up about it around the house. Um, and, and instead I'm now trying to do something about it. So forgive me for taking time on that, but it, um, as you might have uh, inferred, I feel pretty passionately about it. Mm -hmm. um, I All the appropriate caveats will apply around how different people understand the relevant science. So I get that. I'm simply rehearsing the conclusions that I've come to based on my reading of what makes sense to me and how I interpret it. Well, when the, the average life expectancy of a company in the S&P now is about 12 years, um, we certainly can't expect the folks at the top of most of these organizations, even if, even if they are responsible for the long-term planning of the organization to really have this on, on their radar because they don't expect these companies to exist even in a hundred years. So, you know, presumably there are other folks in the greater organization of our society that, you know, need to have time horizons that extend into the period that you're discussing. And I didn't want to talk about universities and governments and, you know, other folks, but, but it seems like there are people you know, in, in, a, in a society, the hierarchy of our society that, that should be, you know, thinking about these sorts of, of horizons. Is there, is there an organizational failure here? Um, you know, I don't know. At, That's at those a, other levels? Well, let me bounce this off you and see what you think, which is that, um, so I don't know if the, if the lifespan of a company in the S and P is 12 years, maybe they something, you know, the, the fortune 500 or among the top companies or what have you. I, I'm not sure. I guess what I would say is that there's a difference between the expected life expectancy of a company and the, the time horizon over which managers plan. Right. And so you can imagine, um, you can imagine startup companies that are on the cusp of going public that are thinking about 
their their future 5 10 15 i mean they're imagining what it will take to build a company that will be significant over the long run whether or not they actually get there is another matter but their time horizon and how they plan and what they do takes those much longer time horizons into account at least it certainly can there's nothing incoherent in doing that and certainly my um fervent hope is that corporations uh are taking climate change very seriously and there's there's a lot of cause for optimism, I think. You know, I read Larry Fink's letter to to shareholders and to CEOs recently. And um, in the same way that each of us as individuals can make smarter choices about climate change, I think companies are similarly making the kinds of choices that will start to really change the system within which we function. You know, my view of it is that markets lead, uh, markets follow, they don't lead. And market failure is what created climate change. And so the good news is that organizations, Deloitte included, um, are making choices right now that will have, I believe, an important impact on, uh, on climate. And they are making those changes not because it will maximize the profitability of the firm, but because it will have a positive impact on things that matter beyond the profitability of the firm. Now, does that mean Profitability doesn't matter. No, of course not. Profitability is a factor in these decisions, but these decisions are not driven by a desire to maximize profitability. They are driven by a desire to have a material impact on climate change. Um, because if we don't collectively have enough of an impact, although um, not that many people see this in quite the, uh, the existential terms that I do, a lot of people see it as a very big deal worthy of, of significant attention. So I think it's um, the fact that to go back to where you started, the premise of your, of your comment, that the lifetime of, of organizations is relatively short. I think that's I think that's not a problem. I don't think that's a limiting factor in taking the distant future seriously, because and the, this is the good news this time. Nobody thinks that that short lifespan is going to be their company. <laughs> Yeah, but the pressures I think on uh, you know for short-term performance uh, certainly can mitigate against um, you know this type of long horizon planning for sure. Well, they can, and the good news is less so all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So Larry Fink is one example. I'm going to hang my hat on that for the moment, which is that it's uh, to the extent that capital is starting to be allocated in ways that take the um, climate change, the climate alignment, if you will, of companies. Do they have science-based targets? Have they managed their scope three emissions on their supply chain? Are they, you know, do, uh, do they think about the full life sky, uh, the full life uh, life cycle carbon footprint of their products and services? Do they make it possible for their customers to dispose of their products and consume their products in climate conscious ways? All of those things are starting to matter to the bottom line. Um, needs to happen faster. And if we rely solely on these market signals to guide our choices, we won't do enough fast enough. But again, markets will follow, not lead. And so as we begin to make those choices and it gathers momentum, I think things can tip quickly. So in, in, in this regard, I'm very much, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, I, I see the situation as hopeless, but I'm determined to make it better. And I think if, uh, if we can all adopt that, uh, that mindset, um, there's hope yet. Well, if, if maybe if you speak like that to your family, they'll, 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 they'll let me talk about the, it at the, dinner again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so I just want to end with one last question. Um, you know, most of the people that I, I talk to on this podcast are, are academics and, um, you know, I have a, some select few folks from outside of academia who are nonetheless, um, I think, you know, deep thinkers, inspirational thinkers. And, and you've spent your life um, in the consulting world for uh, someone who is, you know, coming through an MBA and uh, most of the folks, I think that at least will initially listen to this are, are you know, have taken a path like that. Um, you know, there are certain attractions to, to being in, in, an, in an academic world, certain attractions to being out in the, uh, you know, as in, in the um, arena, as uh, Theodore Roosevelt once said, although consulting is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like you're, you're, you're not in the arena, you're kind of, um, you know, behind the stage, uh, you know, pushing the people out into the arena, so to speak. But, um, you know, how would you, if you, when you were going to get your doctorate, I'm sure that there was a fork in the road at some point, um, and you chose to take this path, uh, 
how would you compare your life in, in consulting versus, um, you know, a, a different path that you could have taken in academia? Um, I don't know. I, I, I'll, um, I have to speak entirely personally. I've been enormously lucky to have had the opportunity to spend 20 plus years at Deloitte um, in a role and in a way that is, um, uh, I'll say unique, because at some level we're all unique, um, but but really very small number of folks, I think, in certainly in my time at Deloitte have had the opportunity to live this somewhat bizarre uh, life uh, within the firm. And so I would say that I've had, um, I've had a very, I've had, I'll say less and certainly a different type of pressure than I would have had as an academic, right? The whole kind of publish or perish uh, mechanism has not, uh, has, has not impinged on me. Certainly I've had, uh, because when I write and publish things in, I don't have to go through, um, an editorial and peer review process where the folks reading my papers are competing with me to publish in the same space. And so as much as peer review has its upsides because experts in the field review your work in scare quotes independently, I've seen this happen. I don't know if it's a generalized phenomenon, so I'll, I'll caveat that, but I've seen it happen where, again, the folks who are reviewing your paper, the folks who are trying to publish on the same sorts of topics with different things, it's actually not in their interests for your papers to show up. Oops, um, not quite as independent as you might like it to be. Um, and as much as folks may disclaim that that, that, you know, I'm sure nobody listening to this is affected by those biases, but maybe somebody they know might be. Um, and, uh, and so I haven't, I've been spared that. Um, the work that I've done uh, faces a broader market test, if you will. So my opportunity to put it out there through, through Deloitte as a publishing channel has led to uh, different in many ways, a set of pressures that I found much easier to work with and within. So that's been very fortunate. And then the opportunity to uh, work with clients that in many ways self-select to work with these ideas has been a, another uh, enormous benefit. So it's not as though there's a specific market that I need to sell the ideas to and find a way to monetize them with. Mm -hmm. the, Deloitte's a big place and does a lot of work with a vast and diverse array of clients. And so the opportunity has been to find the folks who have found the work that I've done uh, useful and compelling and then work with them. And, uh, and the folks who want to go in another direction or find other approaches more useful then that's what happens with those folks. They don't work with these ideas and, and that's okay too, right? As I said at the outset, in my view, nothing's a theory of everything. And uh, there is huge power in understanding the limits of the applicability of your work and your insights. Well, Michael, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. Um, just to remind everybody, strategy paradox, innovator solution. Um, we also have the, um, what is it? The Innovators Manifesto. That, that one's the sequel, which is also pretty awesome. And three rules, how great companies think. Check them out. Thanks again, Michael. My pleasure. Take care. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 